Welcome to our video on daylighting, focusing on controlling glare. We'll discuss three different techniques for doing that, one of which is to use diffusing glass in the aperture. Another is to incorporate baffles or banners in the space, which intercept beam sunlight and diffuse it around the space. And then the last is adding light shelves and other kinds of reflectors. And the first example using diffusing glass in the aperture, well, in fact, all of these examples will be represented by a very familiar uh, example that you're aware of. Uh, if we take an incandescent lamp, which has two wires and a tungsten filament that glows white hot, and this is surrounded by, uh, in the old days, a clear glass, and you can still buy these under some circumstances, with a clear glass and this is an evacuated volume that keeps this uh, tungsten filament from burning up in the heat uh, so we have to keep oxygen away from it. If we have a lamp like this and the human eye um, looks at it, this extremely localized and extremely bright filament tends to focus an image on the retina which is extremely confined and extremely intense. And I've referred to it as a point of light, but I just mean by that it's extremely localized uh, and it's tending to burn the retina. So this is actually a pretty dangerous thing to have. And we have a similar issue with the sun because the sun is actually burning at a higher temperature or glowing at a higher temperature than this filament. So staring into the sun, of course, creates extreme pain and damage to the retina. Um, and we feel it so intensely with the sun that we tend to look away. Sometimes we can look at a bulb like this, though, and because it's only burning a certain part of our retina and it's not burning it quite as bad as the sun burns it, we might actually put up with that pain and, and um, in, in inadvertently be doing damage to our eyes. So very few people use these kinds of bulbs because they actually represent a potential threat to the human eye. But the analogy would be this filament is the equivalent of the sun and you basically want to be protected from that. Now the first thing that we do is we do something called a frosted lamp where this glass is made into a diffuser. So every time a ray hits the surface it does not go straight through but it basically scatters in a variety of directions and some of it will go towards the human eye that's observing it. So now the human eye is getting light that's off of this entire surface rather than this extremely localized light from the filament. Um, as a consequence, you look at a lamp like this and you're no longer doing serious damage to your eye. You will sense a great deal of visual discomfort when you do this particularly if you enter a room that's being illuminated by one of these bulbs, that bulb is so intensely bright compared to whatever it is you're trying to look at that it becomes almost unbearably difficult to um, accomplish the task, which may simply be, you know, to be able to move around the space without hurting yourself. To do that, you have to keep your eyes open and your eyes are trying to adjust the, the pupil to let in as much light from the dim environment, but the bulb is, of course, challenging your ability to do that because your eye is trying to close itself down to protect itself from the bright bulb. Uh, the next sort of level of enhancement that we make is we put a shade around this bulb, and so now the bulb is diffusing over an even larger surface area. And by the time we do this, a typical uh, electric light lamp in our house is pretty comfortable to look at. And of course, it's typically open on the top, so it's sending all that light up to the ceiling, which makes that light less disturbing because it's bouncing off of a secondary source. So as we've gone through this process, if I go back, we have basically a point source on the human eye right here, which is extremely damaging. Then we go to this situation, we've distributed it over a much larger part of the retina. And then when we go to this situation, it's distributed over even more of the retina. And now it's basically in the comfortable zone. All right, so the analogy might be, 
to the frosted bulb as we come along and we put some diffusing glass in this aperture and um, so when that's looked at from the inside it looks like this which is still very bright and can be disturbing just like the bare uh, bulb that has the frosted glass can be disturbing but it's at least not damaging any longer so we don't have beam sunlight entering into this space through this south facing aperture we have diffuse light coming through this diffuse light by the way is really disabling if you have say a blackboard on this wall and you're standing over here staring at that wall trying to see a black task when you're when you have this intensely bright source in your eyes so this is an example of an actual building that was built based on this and there were reports of discomfort from this diffusing glass uh, interestingly enough it was extremely age dependent almost everybody over 50 or 55 did not have adaptable enough eyes to tolerate this bright source pretty much every everyone under 35 loved it and the people in between were sort of mixed in their response so this kind of represents another level up where instead of diffusing the light at this point it's distributed over a larger uh, series of elements and more surface area these are called baffles uh, their space is variable to make sure that we have no more of them than is necessary to block all of the beam sunlight elements that might penetrate through that aperture so this is a south facing aperture we've got a nice overhang here and we're diffusing light over this surface and over these baffles so this is a cross section of the Mount Airy library and this is what the building actually looks like there are several different daylighting sources there's this strange uh, dished out roof with apertures here and there but most of the roof is this sawtooth which is basically uh, this structure right here so that's the interior view this is looking up at the at the baffles which in this case are just thin sheet metal painted white and rather than just dangle a sheet of sheet metal they've turned it into kind of a little i-beam and that's just to keep it from wafting around too much in the air movement from the hvac system in this case you'll notice an extremely primitive electric lighting system these are t12s they're not very any energy efficient fixtures and the reasoning behind that was they spent their money on the eight on the daylighting system because they figured if they did the daylighting system right they'd almost never need to have the electric lights on and that turned out to be the case in this building during daylight hours over 95 percent in the high 90 percentile the electric lights are off and the only time they're on is basically at night so here's a model of that this uh, shows some of the features on the south wall. The north wall also had glass. And this model was designed where the south wall element could be blocked off and the north element so that we could do a study basically of just what was coming through the sawtooth. But we were able to look at a south zone by opening this up or a north zone by opening up the north glass. Or we could shut off both of those to just look at a, an interior zone of this building. This is what that looks like inside. Okay, here's an example of what not to do. Uh, don't design a bunch of baffles that need to be white, 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 as reflective as possible, and then start putting dark colors on them. This is basically an aperture system that is supposed to be working like that, but instead it's not working at all or very poorly. Uh, beware of interior designers. Interior designers typically have no training in daylighting. They don't understand the need for bright reflective surfaces. Many of them are strongly inclined towards really dark surfaces. And so if you've got a daylighting system that you want to make sure it works, make sure that you have either you either do the interior design yourself or you have someone on board to do the interior design that understands the overall daylighting philosophy. Now there's a, a third kind. One of the things that I 
tend to not like too much about this kind of baffle system is there's really no way that you can even look out through the aperture because the, the baffles have to be designed to intercept any light that would come through the aperture. And so you have this kind of interesting space up here with the sawtooth and yet you kind of establish a visual ceiling with these louvers that sort of blocks your view of that volume up above. So one of the things that I like is this notion of baffles, excuse me, banners. In this case, the banner might be a fabric which is about equally balanced between transmitting light and reflecting light. It could also be a diffusing plastic or something like that. Can be relatively inexpensive and the key thing is to figure out how to do that without putting elements in the space that are flammable. So fiberglass fabric is not a bad candidate for this in that it's fire resistant and uh, is a pretty good diffuser. The idea of the banner though is it does have to track so to avoid sort of permanently blocking the view of the glass you put a reduced element which intercepts and, and absorbs less light but also gives you that view but that element needs to track and typically it needs to be moved three or four times during the fall and three or four times in the spring part of the year. Now here's an, another problem that you may encounter with south facing apertures. This one has a diffusing material in it and we may think okay we took care of the worst part of the glare and therefore we have a fully functional space. That doesn't turn out to be exactly true though. This was a classroom and I happened to be there in the middle of December um, which is very close to the winter solstice. I was there with a teacher and several students and I put my meter in one of the dark corners of this room and the room was very bright because the beam sunlight was incident on the south facing glazing. And the a cloud came over and the light level went down pretty dramatically and I went to check my sensor in a fairly dark part of the space and the sensor said we still had enough light to meet the prescribed code uh, requirements and as I was looking at the meter I noticed that the electric lights went on and I thought that's very interesting that that we still have enough light but the lights went on and I thought maybe there's some delayed sensor uh, controlling them, but I turned around and I realized the teacher had turned on the electric lights. And the problem was that at one moment she had this very, very intense luminous environment and then within a, a matter of a couple of seconds it plummeted down and her perception was, and, and her perception is what counts, her perception was she didn't have enough light. My meter said she had enough light, but my meter really doesn't mean anything because all of our guidelines for light levels are based on the assumption that they're steady. In a dynamic environment like this where light is changing fairly abruptly, people are going to have responses to that and that's going to determine what their lighting needs are and they're going to turn on the lights in accordance with that. So we, we need to be really careful about introducing dynamic qualities and then ignoring the potential impacts of those dynamic qualities. So we mentioned this potential problem with south-facing apertures which is light level adaptation. That one second we have enough light and two seconds later we have a lot less and we perceive that as a problem. So the possible solutions are we can switch to north light instead of south light or we can mix north and south light. So let's talk about some examples. These are north facing sawtooths. They have no significant overhangs. They have no light diffusing elements which improves their economy and they behave pretty well and they don't make the space excessively bright. Now the disadvantage to this space is that it's fairly monotonous. In other words it doesn't change significantly over the course of a day or the course of a year but it's well behaved and it's not distracting. It's also not as exciting or as warm during the wintertime. We don't get any beam sunlight. We don't get the real bright light. 
which we can get from the south apertures and which can be psychologically and thermally very pleasing. But we have to look at how we're using the space because it can also cause a lot of glare or perceptions of inadequate light when a cloud comes over. So this is a nice combination in my mind. We got some bright warm winter sun coming in on the south side, but we mix in some north glass. And this is kind of what the teacher was doing in that space. She decided that she didn't like the extreme variability, so she was going to add the electric lights as a way of sort of evening things out. So that's kind of what this north glass is doing, is it's keeping some mellowness and reducing somewhat the variability, but we still have the nice quality of getting in some bright light and some warmth on a winter day. It's a kind of a balance of all these things. And I think it also has certain advantages in terms of controlling water and things like that. So here's an example of a building that was built on that principle. And it's not what I would advocate structurally. It's a retrofit. The, the trusses are running north and south. They have some slope to them, which means some water tends to build up on the back side here, which has to be addressed in one way or another. But it was a retrofit with a 300 foot long space from east to west, and it had about a 70 foot width, and it was perfectly oriented, so it made sense to introduce apertures. And this is what that looks like um, with the trusses running north-south and the apertures facing north and south. And um, that space, by the way, was supposed to have banners in it, and those banners were designed. The day this building got occupied was the summer solstice, and one of the promises I made them was that on the summer solstice, there would be no beam sunlight entering their space. And they all seemed to be quite impressed that I could make that prediction and actually make it work. Um, and on, on the summer solstice, because there was no beam sunlight, they felt no need for the banners. And um, so I went away admonishing them that they needed to get the banners finished and installed, and they said they would. And I went back a year later and the banners were still not there. I did go around and interview some of these folks that work in these cubicles and ask them about the issue of beam sunlight on their computers. And one of the women said, oh yeah, I remember that problem back in, I think it was in October. And, she's, and I said, so what did you do about it? And she said, well, I just quit working for a week. And apparently when the culture of your company is right, you can get away with that. But generally speaking, people are pretty unhappy when they have beam sunlight that shuts them down for a week. So those banners become really crucial uh, for those clients. Okay, so the other thing we can do, which we've mentioned already, uh, to uh, distribute light around and prevent glare is on these side walls where we have apertures, we can put in light shelves. These light shelves are blocking excess light from this space and bouncing it further into the building. So they're making light more uniform, that's the most important contribution, but they're also actually allowing it to penetrate deeper into the space, uh, which is allowing us to harvest more beneficial effects in terms of reduced lighting electricity consumption. So that ends our video on daylighting, uh, focusing on controlling glare using either diffusing glazing banners and baffles, or light shelves and other reflectors.